Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Property Hustler Show. My name is Andrew, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Elizabeth Kelly, who is a real estate investing coach. She is a multifamily investor and rent to own specialist. So, Elizabeth, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. When I first got into real estate, it was largely my mother's influence. She had just gone to like a weekend uh, rich dad poor day course, uh, right? Yes. The five hundred dollar one. Yeah, bring yeah. your guest. Four ninety seven. Exactly. Yeah. My dad didn't want to go, so she's like, Andrew, you're coming with me. <laughs> right, right out of high school, and then you know, and then uh, for some reason, you know, after that, it was just like uh, I was like a kid mm-hmm. in like this room full of like you know, I think like people at that time. I think it was mostly people in their thirties who were just like at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. I ended up hanging around with you know the rich dad poor dad. Go- people who went to it mm-hmm. and they were all like 15 years older than me and I was hanging around with them and I think mm-hmm. it made me a little weird but it got me into real estate. I don't so. think it, it would have made you weird. I think it would have made you advanced for your time. Uh, I like that. That's a good spin. <laughs> because honestly because you're already thinking so much further ahead like most people in their teens just believe they're indestructible and they live for the next weekend and it's such a different mindset. Like I loved having young people in my in my room when yeah. I was teaching because it was just so fun to see how quickly they picked up concepts and could apply them um and if they were sitting in that room they weren't a typical teenager Mm. so you knew they were going to be way farther ahead than their peers yeah you know that indestructible mindset actually i feel is also an advantage when you're starting going to those seminars young Mm -hmm. right one you know they say yeah you learn something young you're more malleable you're more likely to pick it up and understand it and Mm -hmm. be able to digest it but also you're brave enough to act on it. A lot of people, yep. when they're older, they, you kind of establish a career. You have a family to protect. You have responsibilities that you don't want to jeopardize. So you're not just thinking for yourself. Yeah. And I think it's not just the responsibilities. I know a lot of my clients, they become very fearful about losing what they have. Yeah. And I think when you're younger, you have this mindset that even if it goes away, you can get it back. You've got lots of time. Mm-hmm. And when people get into you know their late 30s, their early 40s, they have some wealth. They have some assets. And they're terrified to lose them and have to start over again. Yeah. Uh, what is it called? It's like the the ivory tower effect where people are just like really tall on the tower because they built themselves up. And the yeah. higher you go, you get a better view, but you're a little more afraid to fall. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's a little more dangerous to fall. Yeah. 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 It's like growing up and getting taller and trying to skateboard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a true story. <laughs> because I, I've seen I've already seen a lot of your stuff. And that's why I feel like I know you quite a bit. And because you have a broad range of things that, you know, you can talk. I wonder if there's any one thing I know you sent in the question about some of the challenges people are facing today. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming, you know, with your with your own students, you're talking about that a lot. Like, how do, how do people pivot? Yep. So many people right now are pivoting to re-educating themselves because they and don't they know what to be. do. Because yeah. this is a market that has not been here since 2008. So if you're trying to do what you were doing in 2018 or 2019, or if you're learning concepts that were taught in 2018 and 2019, you are setting yourself up to fail massively. Yeah, I know that you you have a lot of experience in rent-to-own. You have a lot of experience in multifamily and uh, you, you've done things and you went through that 2008 market shift. Yes. Right. And that actually put you in a position where you had to pivot. And I think that's why you mentioned that you pivoted into rent to own programs as a result of the market change. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's a good exercise of being able to critically think and assess a situation and say, okay, what I was doing isn't working anymore. Now mm-hmm. something else is working. What do you think is the biggest like commonality between then and now that people need to be taking into account? So I think the biggest commonality is challenge and change brings opportunity for those who are motivated. So when we were investing prior to 2008, like we were buying with 5% down. We were buying, you know, we were getting 40 year amortizations and you know, our numbers, like everything looked good. You know, it was hard to go wrong buying a property and now it's changed so much, but it's about you know, a whole bunch of our competition left in 2008. They're like, how are we going to make money with, you know, 20% down? And this is the, the ROI on this is garbage and blah, blah, blah. So we had to adjust our metrics and our measurements of success. Mm-hmm. But that didn't mean we stopped doing what we were doing. And especially we focused to pivoting on longer term strategies. Yeah. So, you know, there we weren't wholesaling. We weren't flipping. We were looking at the longer stuff. And I know you guys are still flipping and you're doing well at it, but I would consider that because you're sophisticated investors. Flipping is not a strategy that I'm working with a lot of clients on right now who are new to real estate because they just don't have the knowledge to know if they're making good decisions. That's a good point. And yes, there is a degree of sophistication that people that some people mm-hmm. need to have if you're going to go into deeper waters, let's say, mm-hmm. and if you're going to try different things. But short of that, I always believe, and tell me if you agree with this, that 
it's always about making sure to operate within the confines of that market. Yes. So when the market shifts, and you're thinking about it like brackets, it's like before we we're operating in the eight hundred to a million dollar threshold. Mm-hmm. Now you might be saying let's operate in the five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. So I still think yeah. flipping works as long as you're now buying in that lower threshold. You yeah. just can't buy here anymore. I, I think like it's still more or less the same. You just have to stay current with the with the market. Yeah, I think. You've highlighted, though, exactly why it's so important to be educated, because if you're not educated, you might be overspending. You might be buying in the right market. You might be over improving the property. You might be, you know, dealing with you might might not be confident enough dealing with contractors and you might end up in hot water. I think when you have the level of experience that you do, you can choose between a lot of different markets to do Mm -hmm. what you do. But when you're starting out, you need to be educated in order to know what you don't know to make the right decision. I think that's why it is good when people turn to educating themselves when they want to when they want to pivot or adjust in in these market shifts and yeah. start doing things different. And I think the other big change that we really made as a result of 2008 with, you know, the qualifying changes and with needing to put more money down, we started working more with joint venture partners. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's another pivot that people should be looking at making now. I was talking to um my mortgage broker the other day. And um, she was saying, you know, stress test of 10%. So if you're an investor, like you might, if, if you do really well, you might get two properties on your own, but you really need partners. Yeah. If you're going to be buying more than that. Yeah. Uh, with a stress test of 10%. I, I've seen some people be very successful in partnerships, right? And mm-hmm. where do people turn to first for partnerships? They turn to family, they turn to friends, and then they start turning to strangers that yeah. because, you know, you need to broaden out your network. Once you've learned a few things, you start mm-hmm. turning to doing it professionally. Yeah. In theory, I think it works, but people end up coming across a whole array of problems that they didn't even think about. It's not even no. business, the problems that they start having. It's just yes, it's interpersonal. It's communication. It's I mean, you're adding this whole human component to your business and you've got, you know, these other people. And then you see people like advertising online going, hey, partner with me. Like yeah. they have a deal. They don't have a partner. They're going to take anybody who comes in with the ability to qualify. Like that's, that's going to set you up yeah. to have some serious challenges. So I always tell my clients, if you want a partner, then let's get a partnership program set up. I always call them the rules of engagement. Yeah. So these are, you know, what does a deal look like? Well, you need to have, you know, good rules of engagement to understand what's an opportunity and what's not. It's the same for a partner. You know, what are the rules of engagement? What are the qualities they need to have? You know, what are, you know, the, the capabilities, you know, have you had the, the critical conversations at first? Yeah. People need to do their due diligence on partners, just like Robert. I was talking to another guy recently, and he was saying that partnership is an art. And he says, but it's not too dissimilar from dating, he says. Oh, it's totally dating. <laughs> it's like dating. It's 100% dating. Yeah, that's and, funny. And figuring out if you're compatible, if you have similar values. What was I, talking? Oh, I was talking to a client the other day, and he was telling me about a mortgage broker. Um, so his sister-in-law was looking to buy a house, and she mm. couldn't qualify on her own. So we explored the rent-to-own option, and she couldn't afford uh, rent-to-own the the payments are higher than it would be if you owned, right? We went down the route. The mortgage broker was like, oh, you should just co-sign. And I kind of had a conversation with him about what co-signing would mean. So then the broker came back and suggested, well, just, you know, do a private loan and just sign this gift letter. Mm -hmm. And he didn't even understand that if he signed that gift letter and then registered a second mortgage on the property, he'd technically be committing mortgage fraud because Mm -hmm. he told the lender, I gave her that money. And then the lawyer is going to register the mortgage for her to pay it back, yeah. which is not a gift. And when people are not educated, those are the kind of decisions they don't even realize. They can get themselves in hot water just having the best of intentions by not choosing the right people on their team. Yeah, that's the thing. People should be going into situations wi- eyes wide open, right? 100%. And the thing is that because so many things, especially when you start getting into legal, I actually, I would love to dive into that point of conversation with you sure. because I find it's interesting, but I also find that it's so great. Like these are things that from from a teaching point, it's like, mm-hmm. how do you teach this kind of thing? Like when I tell people, for example, um, I would correlate that to when, I, when people ask me, what happens if you're re- doing renovations without a permit? Oui. The answer is, well, you're not supposed to. But if you are, this is the potential exposure. Because that's the only way you can really teach what happens when you do that. Because people can do whatever they want. They're going to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. But at least they should know what they're getting themselves into. And if you go and do something like that, you need to know what your potential exposure is, right? Mm -hmm. Um, What was it? And I think some of the Rich Dad Poor Dad guys were teaching this low key was um, uh, real estate estate value inflation. I forget what they call it. But basically, if you're selling a property... Mm -hmm. Um, you're asking 750. I say, hey, why don't I pay you 800? But you're going to give me back forty thousand yeah. uh, dollars upon closing. Yeah. Right. What is that called? That's called cash something. Back. Yeah. It's, it's a cash back. Closing. Yeah. But it's it it is illegal, right? To do it with that intent. I don't know that it's illegal. I'll tell you that the lenders don't like it, and they'll reduce the loan to value. 
So what I've seen people do is they'll buy the property for 800 as long as it appraises at 800 everything's yeah. fine but then they'll do a side agreement behind the scenes where you're getting money back i remember and this is the thing i will look into this and like oh, I'll, I'll i'll probably post something about it but they said that it's, it's called something like uh value inflation or something maybe it's a rico thing that they mm -hmm. say you're not allowed to do that mm -hmm. but and maybe it's not a law thing but yeah there's there's generally a lot of like potential issues that come when people get creative <laughs> And start to solve things. And there's a difference between being creative and operating, you know, outside the normal confines, you know, operating kind of in some of the gray areas and, and doing stuff that's outright Ill illegal and trying to like not disclosing things to lenders like that is outright illegal. Yeah. Like yeah. There's a reason those rules are there and you can choose to operate within them. Or, you know, if you want to be creative, then maybe you're looking at private money or maybe you're looking at B lenders or something yeah. along those lines. But, you know, even the suggestion, well, you know, if you want to put a second mortgage on, just wait 30 days and then go ahead and register the mortgage. Technically, most lender rules probably say that you they don't want someone in second position because in a market like this, you're taking a tremendous amount of risk. Yeah. And that was what I explained to my client as well. I said, you know, you're lending her. She's got 7% down payment. I said, you're stepping in and replacing CMHC to lend that other 13%. I said, understand. And I sent him the article that just came out on uh, CP24, I think it was, talking about, you know, the anticipated declines in the market by the end of the year. And the average is 20%. I said, so not only is your is her 7% gone, guess what? Your 13%'s gone too. And if she can't pay anymore, she's only been in her job one year. If she loses her job and can't pay you anymore, you need to make sure that property is something where you can actually turn around to make money. So yeah. you better have an exit strategy in place, whether it's doing a rent to own, whether it's renting to students, whether it's short-term rental, whatever your strategy is, you need to go into this with your eyes wide open. This isn't just about helping your family as much as you're a good person and would like to do that. It has to make sense. Not everybody uh, <laughs> thinks like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you 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 already nailed quite a few things in there. Like, um, I think the first and foremost thing is you 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 planted contingencies. Yes. Right. Contingencies is something people always have plan A and plan B is like really like not a very great plan very often. But yeah. uh, people need pivot points, and especially in today's market where it's volatile, there's a lot of things happening. We don't know how things are going to go. No, we don't. Right? And I think a lot of us, myself included, were really hopeful that things would start turning around mid 2023. But yep. they aren't even really talking much about the great R word. So as soon as they start talking about that, there's going to be a lot of fear that enters the marketplace, too. So what do you think will happen with the great R word? Right. Like what? Like, what investors do you think are going to be well protected, well insulated, and maybe in a bit more of a versatile position? Um, so the best ones who are going to be well protected are the ones who bought for cash flow. So the ones who bought for cash flow, you know, the the mortgage rates might have gone up. They might have some properties in their portfolio, and I'm I'm dealing with this every week with with people who are coming to me going, I'm struggling right now, I'm in trouble. And I'm farther away from leaving my job and achieving my goals than I was a year ago and I don't understand what happened. Yeah. Um, so those who bought for cash flow will do well. Those who do not have highly leveraged properties will do well because obviously they their lower expenses mortgage, are lower yeah. so the impact of the interest rate increases have had, you know, they've had less of an impact on them. Mm -hmm. um, the other ones who will do well are the ones who are in it for longer term strategies. Yeah. The ones who I've seen who are struggling the most, developers are struggling because, you know, things aren't appraising where they hoped they would. Yeah, their projections are now compromised. Their projections are compromised. Yeah. Um, flippers, again, uneducated flippers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> not, not, a, not a criticism of you, um, but uneducated flippers are, yeah. are not doing well. Um, and uh, people who, like the Burr strategy, people aren't able to pull money out. So those in particular are the strategies that are struggling the most right now. Yeah, when we're talking about about the people who are suffering under circumstances. There's obviously uh, ways to work around the problems that even in each strategy that they're facing, right? Yeah. Um, appraisal values or the birth strategy, people not being able to qualify. Because you said the people are appraising now with a stress test out of 10%, uh, you said. Yeah. Right? I mean, who's qualifying for that? You know, I looked up the other day that the that if you want to be making uh, more than 95% of Canadians, yeah. you need to be earning something like $132,000. Yeah. And that's the upper echelon. And I'm thinking about it and I'm like, basically no one can qualify for mortgage. 95% uh, of people are going to struggle tremendously yeah. to qualify for mortgage, especially under the, the stress sets of 10%. Yeah. So how do people adjust, right? And that's why I think the JVs and the partnerships and bringing other people on board who have credit, who mm -hmm. have income that can sign people you trust, hopefully. Yeah. 
and, you know, kind of get you through these times, right, while things stabilize and recover. Absolutely. I mean, I remember when I was doing rent to own qualifying five years ago, six years ago, I would take their annual household income, I'd multiply it by five, and that gave me a rough sketch, like back of the, you know, back of the napkin kind of numbers of what people could qualify for as a maximum. Yeah. And then when the stress test came in, I had to drop it to household income times four. And if the stress test is now 10%, there's a part of me that's wondering, is it now household income times three? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like that doesn't give us much. I mean, you look at the price, the average price of a house, yeah. and then you look at, you know, the average income times three, and those things are two completely things. Yeah. So now you understand why we need multiple units in a house and we need to look at densification. You understand why we need to have multiple families living in a space. And, you know, I mean, I've seen mortgages come through and there's like eight people on title because that's how many people you need to qualify to buy the average million dollar home. It, it narrows the pool of feasibility. It does. Right. And you now start to f- start finding yourself making uh, a lot of adjustments. It's not even just annually. Now you're making them kind of like every yeah. couple of months. And I think the other big thing that I'm really taking away from this that I probably didn't realize as much in 2008, but right now cash is king. You know, even the people who are doing private lending, but, you know, they have to borrow money in order to do private lending. Like the private lending rates are going up because, you know, even if you're making 12 on a private loan, you know, two years ago it would have been eight. Now you're making 12, but you're still paying 7% to borrow the money. Yeah. And the opportunities that will be coming through that I've already started to see come through from the wholesalers, um, there's some fantastic opportunities coming. If you have cash or you can find cash for a reasonable rate, there's going to be tremendous opportunity in the next 12 to 24 months. We teach people how to flip houses, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the main things that we stress is the contingencies. That, and that's and that will give you the versatility in case things don't go as planned, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't seem to understand right now that because cash right now is king, mm-hmm. which means that the buyer is king. Yeah. Right? That's why it's a buyer's market. Yes. Not really understanding that a buyer's market what it really means is that it's a haggler's market Oof. go and haggle yeah right and we tell people it's like our principle our core principle is this yeah. if you are making an offer on a property and you're not slightly embarrassed about it yeah your offer is too high yeah right be a little embarrassed this is the time for it right yeah. and then this is this is how you also protect yourself this insulates you yes. you have that buffer yeah in there and you know that that's where that's where i think you'll be okay because there is still some positive outlooks like with the increasing population, Canadian immigration, half a million people. They're not building houses that quickly and there's going to be definitely some counterforce yeah. right, uh, being, being placed in. But people need to know how to, how to take advantage of things that are happening now. Same things that you have to your disadvantage mm-hmm. are also your advantages if you just yeah. get on the other side of the table. <laughs> Absolutely. And the other big thing that's happening that a lot of people aren't thinking about as much is a lot of the competition's leaving. For the U.S.? No, well, no, just competition's leaving. Like for you as a flipper, a lot of your competition left. You have the undivided attention of wholesalers right now if you have the capability to close. Yeah, that's true. So it's not, you know, it's not what it used to be two years ago. I remember talking to my clients and, you know, we'd we'd be looking at properties and they'd be like, oh, I I went through the property. There was 45 of us there. There's 22 offers in and, you know, we were the lowest by $200,000. That is not the wholesaler's world right now. And I've seen deals where the wholesale fee was eighty and $100,000. That is not their world anymore either. Yeah. Uh, what's the word for when people defer their defer their positions, right? It's like they they almost bow bow out, right? Mm-hmm. When things when things are tough, right? Mm-hmm. And that's because you know people who started to get into real estate who knew nothing about it, yeah. who weren't actually good real estate investors or good real estate professionals, whether yeah. it's house flipping, wholesaling, whether you're doing whatever, right? Realtors even. Mm-hmm. It's like it was so easy to make money for a good run there. Yeah. And then those people who thought they were something are now nothing. Well, not nothing, but they're just not very good. And they can't compete Yes. because they didn't go through the 2008 thing that you did. Mm-hmm. They didn't go through any kind of major stressors when it was when you actually had to work and perform and have merit and skill mm-hmm. in your profession in order to succeed. Yes. Right. It's like now you need to be good at what you're doing to succeed. How what, what gives? Right. Yeah. It's like uh, and people are shocked. So a lot of people just disappeared. Right? Yeah. They just stopped competing. They did. And here's the other challenge that I see a lot, particularly new investors making, is they just assume that any strategy works in any market. Yeah. And the reality is it doesn't. They, you, there's certain markets where strategies are optimal and other markets where it's a struggle to find a, a deal, to put together a deal that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And you don't just, I'm not just talking about the geographic market, but I'm talking about the real estate market. So executing a strategy should actually be a very perfect blend of the real estate market, the location and the strategy itself. And most people have, you know, at least one of those nailed down. They might have two of them, but very, very few new investors have three of them. And then like the icing on the perfect strategy cake is making sure that that strategy is in alignment with your goals. 
Mm. And that's where most people just fall right off the cliff because, and I did it myself. And this is why I'm such a big advocate and, and believer in educating yourself before you just go and buy a property. We created this whole world for ourselves where we had, you know, hundreds of rental units and we had a property management company. And I remember looking at my husband at the beginning of COVID when we actually got to like take a breath, you know, in, in the first couple of weeks there where everything was in lockdown and nobody knew what was going on. And I looked at him and I thought, I'm exhausted. Like I am living the just decisions I made years ago. I am now living the reality of those decisions. And if I had known that this was the reality, I think I would have made some different decisions. I'm not saying I did, you know, that I would have changed everything, but I definitely would have changed some things and I would have been a lot more aware and I'm much more conscious and intentional now going, do, it's not just about making a decision, it's about making the right decision for my future. Yeah. What is the future that I'm creating if I follow through on this? You know, people people sometimes do something that they initially set out to do something as a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. And then that stone became their rock. Yeah. And that rock ended up having a, ch a chain tether. Yeah, and it <laughs> pulled them under. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you're just like, how did this happen? Right? Yeah. I'm trying to blow yeah. myself off. Where did I go wrong? <laughs> yeah, but, but that's the thing. And you know what? I think people who are good educators often focus on mindset. Mm -hmm. And then bad students don't understand why are we talking about all this mindset j mumble jumble stuff. Yeah. I'm here to learn how to make money. Yes. Not realizing that money is a byproduct of the mindset. I think a another thing that people do is that they assume that they must do things. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, thinking and planning and strategizing is not as valuable as just taking action. I, I was talking to a client the other day, and I'm a very firm believer in coaching. My coaches have 100% changed my life. Mm. I would not be who I am. I would not be where I am without my coaches. So um, my client was talking to me, and he was telling me about a coach that he had. His coach was basically saying to him, he, he came to him with a deal and he said, I'm looking at this deal. I don't think it's a very good deal. I don't think I should do it. What do you think? And the coach was like, stop being a, you know, derogatory part of the female anatomy, mm -hmm. get in there and do the deal. And I just thought that is such a, such a horrible way to approach a deal. I mean, <laughs> apart, uh, completely apart from, you know, how mm -hmm. you just referred to your client, which I think is disgustingly inappropriate. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, to just to bully people into taking action when they are not confident and they are coming to you as a position of trust. I think that's another thing as well. It's much better to sit down and dive into like, why do you feel that way? Tell me what you're thinking. Show me what you're seeing and figure out why that hesitation feels like it's there. And a lot of people just berate themselves. You know, I haven't done anything. I haven't bought anything. I'm, I'm a failure. Who am I? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that mindset piece, you know, as much as we'd like to think that it's, you know, we can get by without the mindset piece. And, you know, you go to a, maybe you go to a real state meetup or whatever. And you're like, oh, there's so much mindset here. Well, yeah, it needs to be there because otherwise who's to say you're making the right decisions? Mm -hmm. You know, who's to say that you're not getting, you know, pushed into something that is not the right fit for you. You need to be educated and empowered to make the decisions about what's best for you. And mindset can either hold you back or propel you forward. So just to be clear, you wouldn't just push your kid into the water, teach him how to swim. I personally would not. <laughs> okay. I don't recommend that either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, just, just so I understand where it is you're coming yeah. from. Because, I mean, that seems like what it is they're doing. Sometimes people, like you said that with the rich, that poor, that thing, you, you would see yeah. people coming back again next year and they just haven't done anything. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, I know what it's like to when, when I'm trying to help somebody and it feels like instead of me pushing them forward mm -hmm. and helping them propel, I feel like I'm yanking them with the chain, trying to get, yep. the, come on, you said you want to do this, but they don't want to do this, Yes. right? And then some people I noticed respond to like that aggressive, like if, if, if you don't take action now, you are this, but that's also goes yep. to like a very cringy sales pitch, Yes. right? And it's hard to tell whether they're actually there doing that because you need it and that's what you respond to or it's because they're just looking to get paid. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, we're definitely seeing this in, in the world of coaching now that your philosophies and your reputation and your decisions have a tremendous impact on yeah. your students. And we need to be very mindful of that impact because we're literally, you know, helping people change their lives. To that, I know that people will go to coaches that they resonate with, you know, people mm -hmm. who are just like, I, I can get behind their principles, their philosophies, who they are. You know, that's why it's like uh, people subscribe to if you're a family man, you mm -hmm. might look for another real estate investor who has a family because if you're talking to somebody who doesn't have a wife and kids and you do, mm -hmm. they don't know what you're balancing. 
Yes. Right? Not not like you do, right? <laughs> so I mean, and, and you have and you have certain experiences. I think people would ask you about. Like, are you still? Do people when when you're doing coaching? Do people come to you and ask you questions about how's your rent to own strategy working today? How is your multifamily investing working today? Mm-hmm. And do you still follow that in today's market? Do people still ask me questions? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> For sure. I, yeah, I yeah, love yeah. going to networking events because I just have the opportunity to meet and chat with so many people. Um, and I, I think one of the important things that we need to do as investors is become an expert in our strategy. We mm-hmm. need to know the markets that it works in. We need to know the fundamentals. We need to know what we need to tweak and pivot. So for me, for example, right now with my rent to own business, um, you know, in the past, you know, few years, I've been able to use projections of, you know, 3%, 5%, 7% in some markets, like the Ottawa market appreciated 19% one year. So it's really easy to do, you know, a five or 7% appreciation as a fair estimate of, for future market value for the client to buy the property. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I couldn't in good conscience do 7% in the market right now because mm-hmm. I'm not confident in three years that the properties will have appreciated 7% when there's 20% decrease. Yeah. So you have to know how to change your, your numbers or change your expectations or change up your strategy in a way that enables you to continue to do that in markets. I mean, there's, there's benefits. With every change in the market, there's going to be benefits and offsetting um, uh, challenges. So one of the benefits right now with doing rent to owns is the market isn't isn't as competitive as it used to be. Yeah. I can buy properties for less money, and I can buy properties that are more in line with what uh, what my hallmarks are for a good rent to own property. Yeah. So and you couldn't do that in the last two years. So it really opens up your consumer audience, right? Mm-hmm. And when you do this, you don't do this for you do this in partnerships with people, right? The, I do. Yeah. yeah. So you teach other people how to partner with others, and essentially they for people, I guess, if I had to imagine the clientele, it would be people who are a little bit stuck or kind of stuck on the cash flow. They want to sell where they don't want to sell in today's market market so there's a happy median there yes where you can do rent on programs so rent on programs i imagine it probably the same way that it that it flourished for you back in the 2008 shift is mm-hmm. probably doing better for you today isn't it it is like you make more money on each deal because the prices are higher when i started doing rent to owns in 2009 and, and 2010 i started with properties that i already had in my portfolio so properties in new market i had single family homes and some duplexes so i started there and then i was doing rent to owns in new brunswick yeah. And out in the Maritimes. And that was one of my biggest learnings with the importance of aligning a strategy with a market and with the current market status, because I did not very well on some of the rent owns that I did in New Brunswick because there was very little growth in the market. So even though I projected 3% or 5% growth, the appraisals at the end of the the term didn't come back with that. Yeah. And I thought it was great. I'm like, oh, I can buy houses out here for $150,000. Well, that correspondingly is a $7,000 down payment. And let me tell you, if something changes in the client's life, they just walk away. <clears throat> And now you're left with a hundred and fifty thousand dollar vacant home, and you have to figure out what to do with it. Yes, and what's your contingency there? <laughs> well, my contingency was always so. The way I buy now, I always look for properties where there's an opportunity to force appreciation and then list for sale. That's mm-hmm. always my. If my tenant buyer doesn't buy the property, that's my go-to strategy. Um, my secondary strategy would be to re-rent to own it. Yeah. And then my least favorite strategy would be to put a tenant in it because the abuse that a property takes when you go from owner occupied to rental property Mm -hmm. is generally pretty significant unless it's a high end property. Yeah. You know, actually, with the with all the backlog with the landlord and tenant board today, with all the fear that landlords have when it comes to renting their property out. And even now they're starting to try to really restrict the Airbnb market. Right mm-hmm. and how that's performing. Uh, people are looking for alternative solutions, creative solutions, right? And I think people are looking for what um, I see some people doing uh, midterm rentals. Yes, right. And uh, they're even doing B two B rentals for they're they're leasing out to businesses who will rent out uh, to their employees essentially, mm-hmm. or they're doing things like that. And I think rent to own really ends up really puts the landlord and the tenant kind of in the same boat of sense of ownership. Yes. Where you where you hopefully you're just going to avoid. You still have the landlord and tenant board to deal with if something goes wrong, I think, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So so in a rent to own, at least the way I do them, my clients sign two different agreements. They sign a lease agreement. They have all the rights and privileges given to them by the Residential Tenancy Act mm. in Ontario. And then they also sign an option contract. 
And that's where I house all the other pieces. And they tend to be pieces that are basically training for them to be homeowners. And that's the way I approach them. Listen, you're a homeowner in training. I'm here to help you, but you need to be doing what you would do if you owned the home. But it also, for me as an investor, it represents a cost savings because I no longer need to pay for property management. I don't need to pay for snow removal. I don't need to pay for lawn care. I don't have to worry about pest control yeah. and all these other things, you know, utilities and all those other things. None of those are my responsibility in a rent to own. So I do these things called strategic calls a lot. You do a couple a week right now with with investors who bring me their portfolio. They're struggling. They're like, how can how can we get this back on track? Yeah. So one of the exit strategies we look at is, you know, rent to owns. You know, how can we turn this property that's negative cash flowing for you? What are the opportunities there? Can we turn it around? Yeah. You know, it is funny you mentioned that because we have been implementing some rent to own strategies for some of our house flips because mm. generally we flip properties that are versatile in that there are duplexes, triplexes or something and they have mm-hmm. they have other contingencies to it. But for single family homes, which is the odd one here and there, uh, it's ideal for a buyer. Yeah. It's really not ideal for rental, yeah. but the rent to own option offers us uh, a cash flow system that will at least break even. Mm-hmm. And then we have a good exit point for the future market. And in all honesty, it, there is also security of if they fail to purchase, at least we have the deposit for the cushion. Right. Yes, so absolutely. we're 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 sheltered. So yeah. it is a really great option. But you said when you're working with us, I want I wanted to know because you you do so much of it. Um, what is your elevator pitch? So if somebody says, you know, if a seller comes to you and they says, you know, what is what is rent to own? You want to explain rent to own to a seller. How do you go about explaining this to somebody who isn't familiar? Like, what's the quick and easy understanding for rent to own? I basically explain to them it's like leasing a car. You have monthly payments. You don't own at the end, but you have the option to purchase at the end should you so choose. And the car company does not have the option to call that back. It's pre-agreed, you know, the purchase price and everything else is all laid out there in the beginning and the client has the opportunity to buy if they choose. Okay. Actually, that's that's really simple. Really easy. Yeah. Now I can keep that in mind because that's a good (laughs) one. Yeah. I know some people have uh, asked this question, so I feel this would be good to know is, are there any, because right now there's a lot of people who are looking at buying and they're now pushed into the rental market, Mm. but they can't, and there's people who also fall in between where it's like now with the stress test changing, they used to be able to buy, now they can't really buy and they need a little bit of time to adjust. So that's actually the perfect buyer audience, I would think. Mm -hmm. But for any of them who are looking to do this, are there zero down options to do rent to own? I'm sure there are out there. As a coach, I would never, ever recommend anybody Mm. did that. When I started doing rent-to-owns in 2008, there were people in Alberta doing zero down options because they had no mortgage down, or they had no down payment mortgage options out there Mm. in in Alberta. Um, And those are people who generally got burned pretty badly because your tenant buyer has no skin in the game and you have no additional security. If there is somebody as as, as a company out there offering it, I would recommend not because it just places all the all the security that you get from the down payment and from the tenant buyer being committed and having skin in the game, all that evaporates when the down payment leaves. I, I understand. It's kind of like actually working with A lenders versus private lenders where you can go for like uh, more riskier circumstances, but it's easier to get in the door, but mm-hmm. it's harder to actually maneuver once you're in. So yeah. I feel like that would be the comparable. Are the rental home programs generally standardized or are there is there a lot of variation that people can look at? So are you talking about if if I was a, if you were a tenant buyer or if you were an operator or an investor? So let's just say uh, not as an operator, but let's let's speak to real estate investors who have properties right now, because that's that's really the pivot point. A lot of people are looking at people own properties and they're and they might be interested in rent to own. Gotcha. Uh, The programs that 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 work, are they generally standardized as in like it would be a program that an investor is offering through Mm -hmm. an operator or themselves? Uh, And then there would be somebody who's going to be buying into this program. Right. As a a a buyer, buyer. a tenant buyer. Right. Yeah. So are those programs generally standardized or is there a lot of variation? No, there's a lot of variation because there's no kind of governing body. It's not like when you're a mortgage broker, you've got, you know, the, the governing body that kind of dictates how you operate. And mm-hmm. um, there is the Canadian Association of Rent to Own Professionals, Care Op. Mm. So they sort of have a, a standard of, of how they want their members to operate. And then in return, you can, you know, say that I'm a Care, a care Op member. So there's sort of a minimum level of due diligence there. But in general, I mean, and this is part of the reason why rent-to-owns unfortunately have this reputation as being 
you know, they're, they're a scam. And it's because there's people saying that they're offering rent to owns and there's no written agreement. Mm. Or, you know, they're setting the tenant buyers up to, to fail because they're not doing the proper due diligence to make sure that at the end, their income is actually sufficient to qualify <clears throat> for a mortgage. So, you know, they just turn around and go, oh, sorry, you can't buy the house. Out you go. And they start the process over again. Yeah. So if you have a property that you would like to turn into a rent to own, then the due the onus is on you to do your due diligence on the rent to own companies and to approach them and say, hey, you know, tell me about your program and tell me about, you know, the security. There's two different ways that a rent to own could be structured at that point. One of which would be called a sandwich rent to own. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's sort of a term that's that was very popular previously. It's not very popular now. But what it basically was would be that I as a rent to own operator would come in and I would rent your house. Mm -hmm. I would do a rent to own on your house and then I would find a tenant buyer to do the rent to own for me. And I would it, all the numbers would be slightly higher. So I would basically be the filling in the middle of the sandwich and I would make the spread between what I was paying you and what they were paying me. It kind of makes a little bit more performance based, but you take on the risk of, of the deficiency efficiency when trying to find somebody. You when trying to find somebody and also if they stop paying, you still have to make those payments to the owner. Are you then a corporate leaser? No. No, I would do it as a it would basically be like a, a subtenant, right? A sublease. Yeah. But you as a lease, you're leasing as a company from the actual Oh, owner. I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's interesting. It's, it's kind of like Airbnb arbitrage, but with rent to owns. Yeah, that that's interesting. Uh, curiously, um, just as a side question, does that end up still falling under the RTA? Because technically now you're a commercial lease. I, I would guess. I mean, we do sign the residential lease. Yeah. Because even though it's a company name, like you can rent a space in a company name and still yeah. fall under the Residential Tenancy Act. So I've always done it as residential. Just, I'm going to look into that afterwards. But yeah, that's I, an interesting I would... question. Please follow up and let me know what <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, what yeah, you because discover. Because based on, on the conversations that I've had, even though it's a corporate name, that doesn't automatically make it a corporate lease. Yeah, because some things don't end up applying, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, like certain things under the RTA don't apply. For example, when your property is corporately owned, you mm -hmm. cannot serve an N12, right? Because yep. uh, you, a corporation can't take personal possession, right? Exactly. So then I yep. wonder if a corporation can actually be entitled to some of the rights that are entitled to a tenant as a person, as an individual. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look into it and we'll be able to talk, catch up about that more later. That sounds great because you know what you just made me think of? Yeah. You just made me think of, you know how it's challenging with student rentals to have guarantors because technically they don't occupy the property. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that would technically be an issue now, the fact that I never I never occupied the property. The fact that you never occupied the property as a tenant mm -hmm. and you're the guarantor. Uh, yeah, actually, I don't know. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of there's a lot of things. Like, people sometimes have questions. By the way, I, yeah. I find that when it comes to the bulk of the questions people ask, people have a lot of like operational questions when it mm -hmm. comes to real estate. People talk about real estate in a way that, you know, even what we're talking about, a lot of it's very high level. But the day-to-day -day stuff is like where a lot of the questions are. When we're talking about the mindset, mm -hmm. people want to know how to do things very often. Yeah. And uh, they're so focused on how to do things, how to solve problems. What if this problem? What if that problem? What if that problem? How do we get around this obstacle? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's when people get bogged down in the work. This is where the property management was probably very engulfing. Yeah. Right. And uh, and then it distracts you from being a real estate investor and yeah. broadening things out. But I think uh, I think you are. I can understand why people will come to you for a lot of the answers to these questions, because these are things that people need to know how to do. Absolutely. And I think sometimes people like when I started investing, it was a different world. I mean, you know, we were still using fax machines to send offers back and forth and, and that kind of thing. Now there's so much information out there on Google mm. and you should be able to do your own research and your own due diligence and it's trust but verify. Yeah, exactly. That should be more of the sort of the, the idea of what we adopt. Incidentally, if you're ever playing around with it, have you ever used uh, any of the AI stuff like ChatGPT? We're getting into that. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's funny because uh, I was testing it just to see, and I would even ask it questions like, "What is an N4 in Ontario?" Yeah, and it would actually pretty accurately tell me. Really? And I was like, actually, kind of surprised about yeah. that. And you can ask it to write you lease agreements. You can ask it to like to write you. Um, uh, agreements between landlord and a vendor to do lawn maintenance and it will give mm -hmm. you uh, indemnifications with it and all kinds. It's very remarkable. I think wow. that's a great tool for landlords to use. And as we progress on these things, people need to start using more and more tools that are available to them and kind of shorten the time it takes to educate yourself. But verify, as you said. Yeah. Because there's a lot of information out there, not a lot, a lot, of, not a lot of knowledge, as they say. Yeah. And, and I think I'll be interested to see if they ever come out with a software. I mean, I guess deal check is probably the closest thing to, to what I'm thinking about. I love deal check. I use it mm. with with all my deals. But I think it's important to understand you have to, even if you're going to use AI, you still have to know what an opportunity looks like for you. And that comes back to the rules of engagement that we were talking about before. You have to know what's your minimum ROI. 
Um, my friend Christian uses IRR, internal rate of return. He, he talks about it all the time. Um, it makes my head pop off. Uh, but he swears by, you know, it has to have an IRR of 30 or he's not interested. Mm. And everybody has sort of their different metrics and the things that resonate and make sense for them. But if you don't have an idea of what your rules of engagement are, you're not going to recognize an opportunity or a, a bad deal. It's hard for people who are just starting out to really gain that. Ultimately, if you were going to use a metric like that, you're basing it off of somebody else who's experienced, mm -hmm. who has that system already in place. And you're saying, well, he's do using this metric, so I'm going to use this metric, right? Mm -hmm. But then you're not really considering stress tolerance, right? Everybody's stress tolerance is a little bit different. And that's why people need to educate, confirm, and then do a little bit. A lot of people go and they treat education almost like entertainment. And they're just learning for fun. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, they come to the seminars, they come to events, and then, you know, they, they learn all these things and then they don't actually use it. And then they don't refine it. And then they, it just kind of like, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Or they get completely overwhelmed by it. Because I see mm. a lot of people like that, too, where it's almost like they have all these puzzle pieces. Yeah. You know, they they webinars and podcasts and books and events and everything else. And then they sit down, they go, okay, I'm going to invest in real estate. And they're like, I have no idea what my plan actually looks like. I don't know what my journey, should, like what my path should be. I'm just totally overwhelmed with information and I don't know what the next step is. Yeah. And, no. and that's really common. And it's a tough place to be. That's why it's interesting to me when people are exploring this strategy, that strategy, that strategy, that strategy. And really, if people understand where the goal is, mm -hmm. it'll probably be easier for them to pick out a strategy and just go with it and stick stick with something adjust a little bit if you find it goes against your nature but people really need to hone in on their goal yeah. and then figure out which strategy actually gets them to that because that's a little bit more measurable are you still doing multifamily uh, i'm not buying multifamily mm. i'm actually in the process of tweaking my portfolio and we've been selling for the last couple of years oh interesting okay so you're selling your multifamily is it just because you want to pivot into something else or is yes. just that now the time to sell multifamily no I mean, we definitely did better selling at the beginning of 2022 than we are right now. Mm -hmm. um, multifamily as an asset class has been actually fairly stable the, the last year just because the demand is so high. But in my opinion, it's very hard to find multifamily deals right now where the numbers actually work. We're just paying such a high price per unit. Yeah. What, what price are you finding you're paying for unit? Well, it depends where you're looking. And I... I as I said, I'm not buying right now, but I'm seeing most of my clients like upwards of $200,000 a unit. You see, it's it's interesting because while it is getting harder for buyers to buy the properties uh, and rents being pushed up the way that it is, mm -hmm. if you have multi-unit property and you are having turnover, it's actually a really great thing for you right now as an investor. Yeah. Like your numbers are starting to perform, which makes me wonder about when, when people are doing the burst strategy right now, how effective is it with multifamily because it's performance-based property. Mm -hmm. But if you have everything set up, you can probably refinance a little bit easier. We're finding it's easier to refinance on our commercial properties, commercial mm -hmm. residential properties, yep. than it is on obviously any other regular residential single duplex is not refinancing mm -hmm. as well as we would like. So the pivot points are not as reliable. Yes. Right. But I, I think the financing options now, especially the new CMHC program has made it a little more attractive because mm -hmm. I mean, conventional financing, you know, up till about six months ago, like I'm seeing clients with stuff at, you know, 50% loan to value. Like you, you can't refinance and pull much money out at 50% loan to value if it's already mortgaged to 70. It's not worth the lender fees. No, it's not. <laughs> it's absolutely not for yeah. sure. If somebody's looking to pivot in this market, do you think partnering up with others to buy something bigger, more stable, like multifamily properties, would you consider that a good pivot point for some people? For some people, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say it's good for everyone. And the, the caveat there being, I think that people need to approach partnerships with the same due diligence that they approach properties with. You know, we can't just assume that, oh, it's a partnership, you know, and we do all this due diligence on deals and we're like, do the numbers work? And they, they check everything over and they don't bother to do any due diligence with like basically their, their new prospective partner. And, you know, you and I were kind of joking, um, it, it really is like dating. You know, you're going to have different values, different philosophies, different approaches. Some people are like super detail or oriented and other people are like, ah, no, we'll figure it out. And then some people they're like, show me the numbers. I need to analyze. I need to understand everything. And other people are like, oh, we'll just wing it. You know, those kinds of disparity in, in values and approaches to things can cause significant issues in partnerships. And it doesn't take long for cracks to start to show if you haven't chosen the right partners. Yeah. It's funny you say that because that is actually my relationship with Ping because like he's very technical and very yeah. much about the numbers. And I'm just like, we'll figure it out. Right. Because yeah. 
I'm the kind of guy who's more like I I'm okay to bet on myself because I am confident in my ability to navigate a variety of situations. Right,、mm-hmm. I can take control over things. Whereas he likes to plan ahead because he doesn't like the stress of having to deal with things last minute. As long as you can accept those things about each other and you figure out a way to allow those things to complement each other, because you're not always going to be able to plan for everything,、yeah. and you sometimes need somebody who can deal with last minute situations. Yeah, and you're also not going to be able to always deal with all the last minute situations. So you want to have somebody who's going to kind of like keep those last minute circumstances at bay.、Mm-hmm. Right? By planning, right, right. So I think partnerships are definitely the way to go today, and I think that's kind of where we're leading with this. Is that right now there is power in numbers、mm-hmm. as long as you get the right numbers together. Yes, yeah, and I think an important part of that is putting the right team together, having、mm-hmm. the right people on your power team, so that you know you don't feel like you know your realtor is trying to randomly sell you any property because、mm-hmm. they have a a car payment coming due in the next sixty days,、mm-hmm. and you know they need they need your commission check. Uh, you want to feel like you know your lawyer has your best interests at heart, and you know they're not going to do the old well. Here's here's my business opinion.、Um, you're my lawyer. I'd, I'd like your legal opinion, please. And the business stuff, I have somebody else to help with that. So we really want to make sure that we have people who have the same values and the same integrity as us also on our power team, so that when everything comes together and the deal looks great, and the partners look great, and the financing looks great, and the building looks great, then we can confidently take action. And that's the biggest challenge I find right now is there are very few investors who. Are making decisions with confidence. Yeah, they're crossing their fingers and hoping. And yeah, that that's okay if if you don't have big things at stake. But I understand people's hesitation because we're not talking about you know a hundred dollar pair of shoes that didn't fit when we got it home. We're talking about you know half a million dollars in property and the the potential losses there can be significant. Tell me about any one of your students who has been having a hard time with the market shift right now that you've、mm-hmm. been able to help make a positive improvement in their lives right now. I have a, a client and he is he is such a hard worker and he is so keen and he left his job a couple of years ago and he built this portfolio and he was really proud of himself. He's got between ten and twenty doors.、Mm. And he was actively doing, you know, flips and and burrs and some duplexing and some different renovation projects. And as the interest rates went up and everything changed in the market, the appraisal started coming back low. So he couldn't pull the money out and churn the money the way that he needed to to be able to fund the future projects. So he got more and more and more bogged down. And by the time he came to me, he didn't even realize how how much he was struggling. He just came and he went. You know, the the money runs out before the month runs out. So we really, the first thing I said to him was, most people don't realize when they become real estate investors, you're not buying property, you're becoming an entrepreneur and a business owner. So you need to approach it as such from the very beginning. You need to know your financials. You need to watch your numbers like a hawk. You might have a bookkeeper and you might have an accountant who are doing the heavy lifting for you, but you better check in every single month and make sure. Your income is optimized, and your expenses are as low as they can be. And when we started really drilling into the numbers, and we started looking at it, this is a problem that a lot of investors make: is that they use cash flow to fund、uh, renovations and that kind of stuff.、Ooh. And you really never, ever, ever <laughs> want、oh. to use cash flow for that. Cash flow is cash flow, and you know, major repairs and that kind of thing. You should have a reserve fund for that. Yeah, you should have other funds dedicated to that. So we've made some tough decisions together. You know, we looked at properties, we ran numbers. We looked at you know how much he's paying and how much equity he has available, and we drilled right down. He knows his numbers like the back of his hand now. I'm so proud of him. I did a coaching call with him yesterday. He showed up and he goes, "I made this spreadsheet." He goes, "I wanted to chart out when I'm paying back my private lenders and what I'm going to do and how my money's going to turn over." He did a whole spreadsheet for a guy who started with me and said, "You know, I'm not great at spreadsheets." He did a bang up job, and I was so so proud of him. I'm like, "You have come so far in six months, and that is why I do what I do, not because it it." It pays me when you can turn somebody's life around like that, and honestly, and a lot of it is very r- relatively simple changes, like、mm-hmm. putting things on the spreadsheet, putting pen to paper, and actually mapping things out. Right, especially for people who are stressed out, and stress makes you unable to think. It does, right, and, and keeps you up. Yeah, and it impacts、sleep. adversely impacts your health. The best compliment I think I got from him is so I don't do monthly coaching; I do packages,、mm-hmm. so that there's a, a fixed number of sessions, and then when we use your sessions, we use your sessions, and then if you want to take two weeks off, you're Not missing out. You're not paying for a month and missing out on half the month. His first package was up, and I said to him, "You know, what would you like to do? Do you want to take a break? Do you want to, you know, have have some time?" And he goes, "Honestly, if I wasn't working with you, I would have lost so much money." And that's the funny thing when I do discovery calls with people in the beginning, most of them are like, "Well, you know, how how much does it cost?" I'm like, first of all, it's an investment in yourself. But second of all, the question, the better question is, how much does it cost you? 
not to make the right decisions? That's a deep and profound question. So it's the question. <laughs> it's the question like you know,、uh, oh, I can't afford to do this, and then the、mm-hmm. question turns around: Can you afford not to do this? <laughs> right? Exactly. And it's like, yeah, the, the the answer is very much obvious more often than not, and、uh, it, it's always a fact of the matter. But people can't even. Conceive or to understand the question when they, sometimes their stresses are so up in their face,、mm-hmm. and sometimes that's when people, if if you can just teach them how to map things out, everything seems controlled. Because at least then you know that you're not just arbitrarily stressing. It, it turns your stress into a measurable objective that you need to hit. I think a lot of people are probably facing that problem that you just described. A lot of people are losing money and they don't know how to steer the ship. In the right direction、100%. until it's too late, and not realizing like when when you said that he says the money runs out before the month runs out. That is horrifying. It, it is. It's terrifying. You feel like you're a failure, and you're not. You're not a failure. You just didn't know what you need to know, and you generally just need some support and some guidance to turn it around. And in literally a couple of months. Um, he's he's turned it around, which is phenomenal, and he's so excited to you know take that noose off that's around his neck and to you know have a good sleep and to go on a vacation with his family and then reset what his rules of engagement are for deals.、Yeah. And he's going to he's promised me, and I know he will because he always he always、um, he always follows through on his commitments, but. He、uh, he said to me, "I'm going to do one deal at a time. I'm not going to be trying to do to juggle all these deals and churn all this money. It'll be one deal at a time. I will grow slowly. I will grow steadily. And, and there's just so much pressure out there. It's you know how many deals are you doing? How many doors do you have? Like all、yeah. these numbers. <laughs> you know who cares how many doors you have if you're negative cash flowing? The rain, I think, is the one that does it. Where they have those pins for how many doors you own. Yeah, that's cool. But I mean. It's also like it doesn't actually tell you very much, you know. It tells you nothing about how good people are at actually running their business. Yeah. It tells you nothing about how much stays in their bank account at the end when all the expenses are covered and all the taxes are paid. Yeah, exactly. People don't always look at that. No,、But、no. I think that's absolutely amazing. Honestly, being able to impact people is, I think, for a lot of people who we've spoken to who are doing coaching, who are helping others, it really is the reward because helping people is not easy. And no matter how much you get paid, to be honest, it's if you're really working hard to impact somebody, the money's not going to be what makes it worth it. But But I find that it's often, you know, it, it's kind of like a gym membership sometimes, where I find that it、uh, it makes other people commit to themselves and to their own process. I have found. I don't know. Do、yeah, you agree with no, that? No, no, <laughs> I I would totally agree with that. I was just I was pondering the analogy, and and I think I absolutely agree with that. Although people don't go to the gym, <laughs> sometimes they pay for it, they don't go. But this is the benefit of one on one coaching. Yeah. As well, I don't do group group coaching, at least not at this point, because I. Hold my clients accountable.、Mm-hmm. You know, you're not allowed to cancel on me because you don't feel like it today. You can cancel on me because you're sick, but you're not allowed to cancel. You're not allowed to waffle on me. You, you know, you're not like I'm going to hold you accountable if you tell me that this is what you're working on between this session and the next session. I'm going to hold you accountable for it.、Yeah. I'm not going to scream and yell at you. This is not a military school. I am not a drill sergeant. But I will lovingly and kindly remind you that this is your future, and if you don't take action, if you don't continue to move forward in a way that makes sense, that is a decision in and of itself. And is that the future that you do want to create? I do think that the people who are able to succeed in this market shift versus the people who are just going to fold and maybe fail are really the people who are pivoting into the right partnerships and also seeking the right education from the right people. So I think your students who are under you are going to have a lot of. Success. Thank you. This has been such a pleasure. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely, it was great. So, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to connect with you? Oh, I've got different ways.、Uh, you can reach out to me. You're going to provide all the details, yeah, I assume. Yeah. But email, Instagram, Facebook Messenger. I'm I'm on all of those. So.